Good afternoon. I'm Anne Illery, Director of US, US DOT's Volpe Center, and I'd like to welcome you to the sixth event in our eight-part thought leadership series on delivering the benefits of the bipartisan infrastructure law, brought to you by DOT's new Project Delivery Center of Excellence, hosted by the Volpe Center. We're happy to see that the interest in this series continues to expand. The session two weeks ago on using NEPA review to define and better shape projects attracted another 350 uh, participants. When Secretary Buttigieg launched this series in July, he said, when it first became apparent that we as a country were likely to pass the $1.2 trillion infrastructure bill, it became immediately clear that one of the biggest challenges we were going to have was actually delivering on that and delivering and managing projects funded by the bipartisan infrastructure law is tremendously important. Today's session will focus on accelerating project delivery through innovative procurement partnerships and financing financing methods, the first of two programs on this topic. I'd like to thank our three expert speakers for today, Adi Tomer, Senior Fellow, Brookings Institution, Maria Lehman, President of the American Society of Civil Engineers, and Morteza Farajan, Executive Director of DOT's Build America Bureau. T today, we will have a one question and answer period following the remarks of all three spe speakers, so I encourage you to type your questions into the Q&A box as we go along, even if we don't have time to answer all of your questions. The themes that they represent are tremendously important as we continue to focus the offerings of the Center of Excellence. So now it's my pleasure to welcome Marteza Farajan at USDOT. Marteza and his team are working to promote innovative project financing solutions and to help state and local governments finance, develop and finance public-private partnership transactions for transportation facilities. Marteza? Uh, and thank you very much uh, for um, that introduction. I don't know if I should share the slides myself or somebody else has the slides that they're going to share, but. Uh, We're gonna pull those up for you, Marteza. Okay, perfect. So while you do that, um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, sorry if the connection uh, is not that good or the quality of picture is not that good. Technical issues happened last minute. I lost the internet in my house, so I'm using my hotspot on my phone. It's working for now, fingers crossed. Um, but that's what we do at Build America Bureau. We do problem solving. Things happen. We try to find solutions, get things done, get things built. So maybe that's a good introduction for what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, going to the next slide, um, just want to give you a high-level overview of of uh, who we are. So Build America Bureau is the one-stop shop that was created last year of uh, President Obama's administration under FAST Act. Uh, it was a requirement under FAST Act to create this one-stop shop that brings different credit programs, as well as a couple of grant programs, credit uh, technical assistance programs, all under one roof. So project sponsors who are trying to uh, learn a little bit more about innovative project delivery, innovative uh, funding and financing options. Uh, don't have to go to different operating administrators. You just have one point of contact. They can come to us and we'll be able to help them. That's why we have uh, different offices, as you can see. The first one is outreach and project development, which basically is like our business development arm. Those are folks who go to conferences, talk to people, let them know who we are, what type of products we have. Our credit team works like a bank. We have underwriters, we have portfolio managers, risk team that does pretty much everything that a financial institution like a bank does when they issue loans and they service those loans. And then recently we started a new office, technical assistance office, which is supposed to provide um, early stage educational technical assistance or planning level technical assistance, best practices, peer-to-peer -peer exchange type of conversations. Um, we have a couple of programs under the technical assistance office and I'm going to touch on a couple of them today, but just in, to inter in the interest of time, wanted to mention where we are, the Office of Secretary of Transportation, who we are, different tasks that we do, and then who we work with internally, which is all different administrators, that operating administrators that we have FTA, FRA, FAA, and MERAD. And then, of course, 
everyone who has a project that is a transportation related project that falls under any of those uh, operating administrators, as well as transit oriented development projects that I'm going to talk uh, about them, will be able to help. Moving forward, um, the next slide. Just want to highlight a couple of important things about our programs. Uh, why our programs are so popular. First of all, we have over $100 billion in lending capacity and our programs are not oversubscribed like a lot of grant programs. Well, that's good news to those who want to uh, plan their projects and have everything in their own hands. With, with grants, as, as many of you know, uh, you apply, but you're competing with a lot of other good projects. Um, um, oftentimes we get two, three, four, five times, maybe even 10 times more applications for funding than what is available. So by default, some projects would win, they would get the grant, some projects, which are really good projects, they're needed, they're priority projects, but simply because resources are limited under our grant programs would not get the funding. And what happens is that they have to wait one year and we all know what happens. Uh, one year later, uh, construction cost escalation drives the price up as well as um, uh, many other things can happen. You know, Maybe the opportunity to uh, incorporate this project with another project that was moving forward uh, at the same time would be lost. Maybe we have to phase this project and pay for a lot of overhead and, and, and you know, some of the soft costs twice. Maybe we have to uh, delay the project, which the benefits of the project would be lost, uh, especially those projects that are supposed to improve safety or bring economic uh, 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 enhancements to the region. We don't want to, to, to delay them. So financing can be a really good option. Our loans can save borrowers anywhere from 20 to 30, 40% compared to what they can get on their own in market because a lot of project sponsors can go to market and for example, issue bonds. But because these loans are subsidized because of the flexibilities they provide, they can save them compared to what they can get on their own in the market. For example, the rate as of yesterday was just 4.7% for a 30, 35 year uh, fixed rate loan. We can even go up to 75 year uh, uh, loans. That's something that doesn't exist in market, especially for projects that have a long uh, uh, life, like tunnels, like bridges. Um, we can uh, uh, structure these loans in a way that there is no payment during construction. And even we can push back the payments up until five years after project completion, especially for projects that are meant to generate economic development or generate revenues. That's a big plus. We also have private activity bonds that are tax exempt bonds that we can allocate to transportation, eligible transportation projects that are being financed through private sector. I should also mention that our borrowers can be private or public entities, so, so both uh, sides. Going to the next slide, uh, just giving you a couple of examples now about different initiatives that I have uh, that we have uh, at, at very high level. I talked about the loan programs. Uh, there is a lot more information, some requirements, some limitations, uh, different eligibility criteria that I cannot cover in just 10, 12 minutes, but I just want to give you a flavor of what's going on. We have a lot of information on our website and you can always reach out to us. I have a dedicated team that's just waiting to receive a call from you so they can walk you through some of these details uh, and, 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 and provide more information to you, even consult with you, have brainstorming sessions. So don't be shy, just give us a call, even if you don't know whether your project qualifies or not. But a couple of good programs that we have put together to further incentivize certain types of projects that are aligned with DOT's strategic goals. One of them is this TPO 49 initiative that basically under a regular TPO loan, you finance up to one third of total project cost, which includes everything about that project. Anything that you have spent in the last five years in terms of environmental studies, project studies, procurement costs, construction costs, design costs, right of way acquisition, utility relocation, all of that. We look at that and we can, we typically finance one third of that. But under this initiative, we go to 49% for transit projects and transit oriented development projects. Uh, we do have a couple of other uh, 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 categories that, that, that we go more than 33% to 49%. For example, if there are good projects that apply for different types of grants, for example, a mega grant, and they don't uh, get the grant, but they receive a uh, uh, high rating, we usually create a list of those projects. We go to them and say that here is a pass for you now to apply for a TIFI loan at 49% instead of 33% uh, 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 sizing of, of, of total project costs. Um, 
it has been very popular and we are going to, to increase the number of categories that will be eligible for that. So stay tuned because we're going to have more announcements coming up for new categories soon. Next uh, slide, I have to go very quickly now. This is the TOD program that, that, that I mentioned earlier. So not only we finance transportation projects like roads, bridges, tunnels, inland ports, ports, airports, uh, we can also finance and also rail projects, whether it's passenger rail or freight rail, we can also finance public infrastructure that is around a fixed guideway transit station under a TFU TOD program. Uh, that could include courthouses, could include uh, uh, community centers, parks, uh, could include government administration buildings, public schools, public housing. Under a RIF TOD program, it's a little bit different. It has to be a, a commuter rail station, but then we can finance mixed use development. So the eligibility is a little bit broader because we can, we can even finance uh, low income housing, for example, or housing or conversion of office to housing type of projects and so on. Going to the next uh, slide, here you see a, uh, another initiative that we have for rural projects, projects that are less than $100 million and located in an area with less than 150,000 in population. Not only do they get all the benefits that I mentioned before, we cut their interest rate to half of treasury rate. So half of that 4.7% will be the rate that they can finance a project at that rate today which is gonna be 2.3% almost. Uh, we have a lot of projects that recently have used this. In California, we have had a couple of uh, bus maintenance facilities for electric buses. Uh, we have had a couple of pro projects in Louisiana. I'm gonna in particular talk about the safety improvement project in Oklahoma just in a few seconds. Going to the next one. Um, <clears throat> uh, this is the Oklahoma project that I mentioned. Uh, uh, their initial plan was to get money from their legislators over 12 years to uh, uh, fix rural shoulder lanes that they have, which were designed and built many, many years ago, not based on today's standards. They have a lot of accidents, fatalities. Um, so the legislators, uh, the legislator gave them money over 12 years. They decided instead of uh, uh, fixing a couple of lanes every year, they would use all of that money borrow against it and get everything done in just three years. So you can imagine how many lives they're going to save, how many accidents they're gonna save because of that nine years of uh, 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 acceleration. Plus they're actually saving uh, money on top of all of that. So $47 million is saved in project costs and, and the crash costs, even considering how much they pay for financing costs. Next. Couple of uh, other projects. This is an interesting project. We're talking to them right now. This is in uh, Washington State. Um, I want to mention that one of the uh, approaches that we are promoting is uh, for uh, multimodal type of projects, trying to figure out what's the best use of a facility, not only for one mode or one purpose, but different modes. And this is a great example that in the in downtown uh, uh, Washington, uh, Mount Vernon, in Washington, they're building this parking garage but they don't really need parking. Right now they have a street parking, but they, the, 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 the mindset they have, which is really good, the vision they have is to uh, build this garage so people, instead of parking on the street, can park in the garage. That will free up this, the street space for other activities that could be outdoor seating for some of the cafes and restaurants they have out there or other activities that, that city may plan. And then in addition to that, while they're building this garage, they're also building a library, uh, community space, um, and, and they're going through this process with us to finance it under our rural project initiative program. Going to the next one, um, you can get a sense of another project, Seattle Sound Transit. They are the largest single borrower. They have borrowed $4.17 billion from us, and there are multiple projects that we have financed for them. And going to the next one, you can also see uh, uh, this is not just about the transit project, but we actually helped them to finance and, and build other things around those transit stations, such as maintenance facilities, such as transit oriented development, because at the end of the day, these are all linked to each other and they need to work together. So, so that's another thing that we do, making sure that different types of projects can move forward at the same time and benefit each other. Going to the next one, um, uh, it's the same one in, in Bell Red neighborhood. You can see that how we are now working to even uh, uh, help the, the city in, in, in Belgrade to, to make some certain improvements to their street network. Going to the next one. 
This is I-66. Uh, this is an interesting public-private partnership project in Northern Virginia, Express Lanes project. What I want to mention here is how this project was procured. A relatively challenging, politically uh, 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 sensitive uh, topic, but uh, Virginia Department of Transportation and their public-private partnership office, they created a stakeholder advisory committee early in the process to bring all of the stakeholders uh, uh, to the table. And they were able to come up with a multi- modal type of approach that is building one new highway lane, that's true, but uh, converting an existing highway lane uh, to, uh, to express lane as well, and having two lanes that will be free for transit, free for high occupancy vehicles, um, and the toll revenue is being used to, 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 to pay for the project and also pay for the transit operation on the project. They're also building parking right facilities to encourage more people to carpool and uh, a whole bunch of other things. VDOT even got a $600 million check from this project that they, uh, they uh, invested in in other types of uh, activities. So that's why we call it a win-win partnership because uh, the road was built, just one new lane. But if you look at the number of people that through this multimodal approach, they're going to pass through that corridor is way, way more than what one lane or even two lanes could accommodate simply because now they're, they're looking at that multimodal approach and, and the way that they're funding their transit is also very innovative uh, through the toll revenue. Going to the next one. Um, no, I'm almost out of, uh, out of time. So we'll go very quickly over these that we know it's difficult. We know it's tough for you to understand how it works. Let's go to the next slide that shows some of the things that we can do with different cities, with different project sponsors. We can get involved, we can help you. This is the emerging project agreement we have signed with city of Austin to help them on a $22 billion package of projects early in the process, even years before they come to us to borrow. We actually have a couple of grant programs that I have listed in the next slide that you can have access to them. Please reach out to us if you want more information about any of them. If you go to the next slide, you will see the, uh, the list of those grant programs. Um, and just wanted to highlight that there are opportunities that we can give you money so you can hire staff, you can hire consultants, so you can actually build capacity within the organization to think outside the box. And, and that's where I'm going to stop. Thank you, Morteza. Thank you for covering so much material in a very short period of time. I know that we're asking a lot of each of you uh, when we ask you to keep your comments short enough so that we can have time for Q&A. So thank you for a very rich presentation. It's now my pleasure to welcome Maria Lehman, ASCE's president and GHG's infrastructure market leader for the United States. Maria? Hi, thank you, Anne, for having me today. Um, ASCE is the nation's oldest uh, engineering society. We represent over 150,000 people worldwide. Um, and as civil engineers, our core value is the health and safety and welfare of the public. So very critical to us. So the work that the Volpe Center and the Project Delivery Center of Excellence is, is doing for the implementation of bill is very important um, to making this historic investment a reality. We want to make sure we deliver projects on task, on time, and on budget, because we need to build public trust and demonstrate that we're capable of delivering big projects and big programs, because we see this as a down payment. There's still going to have to be this level of upper investment over the next couple of decades if we're going to catch up. Um, next slide. So uh, one of the things that uh, that we've been doing for a long time for on top on-time project delivery is having the right uh, technical and financial capacities involved to be able to do this. Uh, one of the projects that ASC has been doing for decades, along with the National Society of Professional Engineers and the American Council of Engineering Companies, the partnership is called EJCDC, the Engineers Joint Contract Documents Committee. These are our engineers and lawyers that have worked through all the details for various delivery methods. And it has made, we've made it our mission to improve construction contracting processes across the country so that we can move quicker. Um, when you consider the 60,000 entities around the country um, that are eligible for grant funding under bill, 
um, probably 50,000 haven't worked within the federal structure um, and may not have the robust contracting mechanisms that you need. So these are templates that are consistently updated that we have volunteers working on on a regular basis to move projects quickly. The Department of Agriculture has almost exclusively used EJCDC documents in their delivery as well as their delivery with um, money that's brought to them through various funding sources. So not just the bipartisan infrastructure law, but the Chips and Science Act, as well as the Inflation Reduction Act. So these fill in the blank resources help communities that don't have the knowledge and provides that extra um, help that they need um, without having a whole lot of extra people involved. Next slide. Um, we have been focused on implementation of bill um, from the day it was signed. Uh, we've been fighting for supplemental funding through our report card since 1998. And uh, lo and behold, we got the supplemental funding. And so um, we needed to make sure that the civil engineering industry was ready to take this on. And so our Construction Institute Summit this past March really focused on um, internal education in the industry to better equip civil engineers with knowledge and expertise on project delivery methods they can use. We added dedicated sessions um, to highlight innovations like what's happening at the Build America Bureau. So people really understood what it is that they can do and how they can do it and where their resources are. And so there was a large audience of engineers there, those who are responsible for not just the planning and design, but also the maintenance. We sometimes forget about that long-term maintenance. Um, next slide. So as we're looking at strategies to address uh, and how do we deliver, one of the biggest things that we are um, quite frankly uh, pretty nervous about is the sheer volume of people we are going to need. Um, infrastructure owners around the country are facing workforce shortages everywhere. Um, and it's actually a worldwide phenomenon. I've been traveling all around the world and uh, everybody's having issues here. And so we need to recruit and retain the people that we have. And we have to streamline processes so that technicians do technician work, administrators do administrative work, and that engineers do engineering um, so that we have better access to talent. The big issue here is that there is not one minority in our civil engineering space that is represented at half what they are in the US population. So women um, represent 14%. Of, uh, of our profession, um, even though we're almost at 51% of the population. It's the same with Asian Americans, African Americans, Hispanic, every group. Um, so it's a math problem. Unless we start getting better at recruiting um, women and minorities into this business and keeping them because they leave the profession in much bigger numbers than others. So we are working very carefully with various federal agencies and we're actually having a meeting um, with various um, council leaders at the White House level at the end of this month on how we might pull some things together to address the workforce challenges that we're seeing. Our board strategic advisory council has taken this on and um, we have several ideas as far as tools to add to the toolbox so that we have the people to do this. This is not just about the designer. This is about not having enough bus drivers. It's about not having enough laborers on the construction site. And so we really need to address this issue. Next slide. Um, there was some conversation about innovative mechanisms. Um, the whole thing here with this picture is, this is complicated. Um, we need every tool we have in the toolbox. Um, what I can tell you though, is that some of these investments and the messaging that this administration and this president has provided to the private sector is really going to unleash innovation. Earlier this week, I was part of a semaphore event on igniting innovation in the digital, America's digital future. And I can tell you in 2020, the private sector invested 30 billion um, in digital. In 2021, it was 35 billion. And in 2022, it's 39. The bipartisan infrastructure uh, law since its enactment has already put down 45.6 billion in investments so far. And that has leveraged a supplemental 
hundred billion from the private side. So the private sector wants to hear that they have partners at the table and that we're all committed and rowing together. Um, I had a conversation with AT&T CEO, John Stankey, and he said his, and we have to do better at delivery because his estimate for just AT&T and what they're doing in build out on broadband, that they are spending more than a half a billion dollars a year because of regulatory delays. So we've got to get better about that. Um, and so it was really important to talk. I mean, I was thrilled to be able to talk about the Nexus because as we know, the internet of things, autonomous vehicles, um, various instrumentation on bridges. I mean, our transportation infrastructure is full of pieces of technology that need to be updated. Next slide. So a little bit about best practices. Um, I can tell you about two specific projects um, that, uh, that, that I've had the uh, ability to work on that I can speak specifically. So the top picture is about lead service line replacements and using digital information to prioritize work. So this was a project done with the city of Buffalo where they have a very poor population. Um, and so those service lines, the money was going out, but it was going out to people that could afford it. And so by using various levels, you know, what the education level is, what the homeownership is in a, in a, a sub zip code, um, how many people are on public assistance, you can see where the poorest and the most needy neighborhoods are. And then you actually can go and make the investments there as they come through the bipartisan infrastructure law, because the money that was allocated is only about a third of what needs to be done to get rid of those lead service lines. Um, another great example, and you know, we talked about the TIFIA loans. I was actually project executive um, for, for a time on the uh, replacement of the Tappan Zee Bridge, the Mario Cuomo Bridge. And I can tell you, um, the governor wanted a very flexible funding stack, but it was very complicated. So we had the largest one, one project TIFIA loan ever given, and it was paid back um, because it was part of a very complex scheme. But what we learned on that project is that we have many of the tools already in our toolbox, but we aren't necessarily using them. So if I were to think about how we work together to deliver quickly, first of all, I would say, think about it being a parallel and not a series process. We have to do things at the same time instead of waiting for one thing to start and end and then we start the next. Whether that's permit review or working on, on the environmental impact statement or whether it's working with utilities, it just doesn't work. It takes too much time and we just don't have time. Um, we need to have a senior advisory team, which includes federal partners, state par partners, local partners, and private partners that meet regular. Maybe it's once a week, maybe it's every other week, but you have to have people on that call that can make decisions based on whatever the challenges were in the previous two weeks. If you do that and you don't kind of get stuck in the mud, um, you can really do acceleration. And just so everyone on the call understands, we did from um, notice of intent to record of decision on the environmental of an over three mile long bridge over the Hudson River in 13 months. I wouldn't do it on every project. It's a lot of work, but it is doable to do something that significant in a short period of time. And then the last thing that I would say is that you have to have an extensive, transparent, and regular stakeholder engagement. The public needs to understand what it is you're doing and how you're doing it and how they benefit from it. So I think um, as we're looking forward, um, it's very important that we think about how we implement projects. And resiliency is gonna be a big deal as we're seeing these almost disasters every other week um, all over the country. And sometimes, you know, you get Southern California had you know, their first hurricane in 80 years. And then at the same time that had a 5.2 earthquake. So we're seeing these complex issues and it's really important because many, many communities use tax exempt bonding um, to fund their projects, um, at least part of it. And those bondholders wanna know that those facilities are gonna be in line for the 15, 30, 40 years that they're getting money. So if we can come up with kind of a resilience standard we might see maybe a hundred basis points on lowering the price and that's magic money. That's money that those municipalities can then invest um, on more resilient pieces to the infrastructure they're doing. So 
one of the big takeaways is every day we work on this, there's new challenges, there's new solutions. And so there's best practices to take away. We're encouraged by all the collaboration that's going on. Um, and we're pushing out a lot of information out to our, our members and to our, the folks that do standards. We do an awful lot of standards in the space. ASCE has 74 various different standards. And so we are thrilled to be part of the solution and partnering with USDOT, as well as many other agencies across the spectrum to deliver better, faster, cheaper. Thank you. Thank you, Maria, for delivering many important points in a very short period of time. I particularly resonated with your comments about workforce. One of the things we've heard consistently in many of these sessions is the importance of daycare for workforce retention um, and daycare at hours that accommodate a construction workforce. So um, just, just as, as a takeaway. Our final speaker uh, today will be uh, Eddie Comer, Tomer, sorry, at Brookings, he is expert in infrastructure policy and urban economics and leads the Metropolitan Infrastructure Initiative. It's all yours. Thank you so much, Anne. Um, and I really appreciate um, uh, Volpe putting this together. The looks like over 500 people here who are, who are online listening. And I wanna be not just respectful of time, but respectful of what, again, looks like at least 10 questions in there. So for those who are thinking about asking them, yes, we can see them on the presenter side. Um, so please put them in there. Um, you know, I'm, as always, I, I've heard words that speak multiple times. It's always inspiring. Um, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a little bit different than the other two folks we've heard from. You know, my job is as in working at an independent, uh, nonprofit research institution um, is uh, it's really to stay at a certain altitude focused on what are we trying to achieve through the projects that we deliver. And so what I'm hoping to impart today is some kind of framing thinking about what's happening through a transportation project delivery uh, prism, if you will. And I'm going to kind of break up my, my comments into, into three parts here. Um, I want to start with kind of macro level um, uh, kind of the macro environment we're dealing with, what are some, some of the biggest trends impacting our current fiscal environment? Then spend quite a bit of time on core challenges. What's holding back project delivery based on our goals and expectations? And then finish um, with some innovations underway and the gaps that remain. Um, and those are more, ex they're specific examples, but some categorical ideas for you to consider going forward. So let's start here. Um, it's There's no question that we're living through a, uh, a historic moment in terms of overall net investment. Uh, what you can see here is all infrastructure sectors um, put against a time-based scale. You can see it's back to 1950, but we've drawn the New Deal level uh, share of GDP on there in light blue. And you can see that in fact, the IIJA, especially when you add it in to the IRA, um, is going to actually surpass at the federal level um, share of GDP spent on infrastructure. Um, so this really is, in the last 50 years, the most heightened moment of federal um, capital investment and then where the monies go to it, even operational investments too. Now, of course, you, you can't unsee on that chart that huge bump in the mid-1970s to the early 1980s. That's to underscore just how big the federal investment was when we were continuing to build out the initial highway system, as well as investing more directly in municipal water systems. But still, the point remains, this is a heightened infrastructure spending moment. Um, now, that there's reasons to be, of course, positive there, that there's more money sloshing through the system, but there's also reason to be skeptical of, can this kind of heightened environment we're going to live in for the next five plus years as IIJ's transport money continues to move through the system, will it last? And that doesn't even begin to address some of the long-term transportation revenue concerns at the federal and state level, too. So that's that's one. Um, the second big macro item I want to hit about hit on today is the increasing sensitivity to cost, though, particularly not just in our infrastructure sectors, not even in local and state government um, practitioners and elected officials, but even among the general public. There is a sensitivity to the rising costs in inflationary terms, right, to build infrastructure. You can see this is the overall construction cost index. Um, there's been a serious increase um, even before IIJA, and we are maintained at levels that are far above overall economic inflation. Um, and then 
to make matters even worse, by FHWA's own numbers, in the transport space, this rate's even higher in the past few years. So that, of course, eats up into that increase in nominal spending. At the same time, there is a new kind of conversation happening publicly. I, I critically here want to show it from uh, effectively both sides of the, the partisan aisle, right? That people are concerned about whether our projects can be delivered on time, at what kind of total cost they have, even what's the vision behind those projects. So people are really starting to wonder if America can still deliver um, infrastructure, transportation included, at scale. And that then leads to my kind of third macro item I want to hit here, um, which is there are emerging forces here um, that show new motivations and new stresses related to surface transport. So from emerging technology and climate resilience, household affordability, resilient supply chains, even inclusive economic development are all fundamentally different than they were even 10 years ago. What does that mean in total? Your old projects and their old delivery methods may no longer work in the current macro environment. And that is a transformative message in my estimation. It is uh, something significant to think about. To put it in practical terms, if you've got a tip list with projects that have been there 20 years and you assume that your citizenry, your constituents, that includes businesses, are still behind those projects just by default, I think you need to go back to your public, right? And, and honestly ask yourselves if those are the kinds of projects you should be building. That then leads to kind of one of the first challenges I wanna to get to, translating values and priorities into future looking goals. So this is the Katy Freeway in Houston in a transportation rich audience, you probably know it. Um, you may not know this, but many of you probably do. This kind of expansion into 20 plus lanes of roadway, and of course over many miles, right? But effectively where there already was a highway, cost us $2.8 billion to build. And of course, as famously, when the KD Freeway opened within days, if not the month, the entire freeway was congested again, right? Which leads to real questions of what we were trying to achieve with this project. Now, why I often use this in our presentations, even though this is a contrast, I want you to see, as everyone probably remembers, the Texas freeze. We have warnings in advance, even roughly at the time that the KD Freeway expansion went into being, that showed it would only cost $400 million to actually um, effectively harden the grid in Texas, which would have saved people's lives, saved countless more in money than it cost um, to do, and frankly, even more money than it took to invest in the Katy Freeway. So this is a perfect example in my mind of translating our values and priorities um, into actual projects that we build. So the second challenge that in my mind relates to delivery here um, is that DOTs are still plagued often with poor asset inventories, right? There are ongoing issues here. We have been talking about this for years and years. It's been heightened, I think, in a, the digitalized environment. Fortunately, federal law has made sure that states are now way up in front. Localities and their various forms of departments of transportation, whatever they may be called or housed under, still need to catch up. Yet across all those levels um, of government, both state, local, and in between, we need to figure out how to connect our project selections, new projects, maintenance projects, again, to those larger goals. So we don't have great asset inventories, and we don't have necessarily great ways to connect our larger goals to the projects we pick. Another challenge um, has to do with long institutional memories around questionable delivery from private firms, specifically on the finance side. We have seen a ton of success here from privately financed projects. For anyone who's spent time at LaGuardia Airport recently, it is far better and it has, was delivered successfully. For those in the greater DC area, right, the express toll lanes um, on the Beltway on the Virginia side on 495 um, have been a success by almost all measures. But at the same time, folks have not forgotten what happened in Chicago around their parking deal. The purple line is synonymous with real challenges on delivering a project. And here's the thing I want to get across, both for the stakeholders here and for others who, who listen later, is that the institutional memories, the messaging around this, it's a, it's a long memory. Folk, folks know about Chicago and the Purple Line. So it's not so easy anymore just to push through projects on the financing side. We need to make sure that all the goals um, align. Next, and, um, and obviously this was just mentioned, there is a continued disconnect between workforce intermediaries and transportation agencies. So you can see here on the charts on the screen, we have major um, uh, needs around job creation relative to our worker separations. We just do not have enough people coming into the field. 
At the same time, the, we know that, as also mentioned, our figures on diversity, both by race and gender, are way below where they could be. Here's one of the problems, though, right? There is so much money in workforce-related funding, but it predominantly goes to the state's Department of Transportation. Uh, and in particular, it's bundled in with their formula capital monies. So the question is, if you're in a state Department of Transportation or you work at the local level and you, you, uh, you liaise with them, we've got to figure out how to motivate folks to maybe build a little bit less in terms of physical projects to be able to spend what's effectively infinite on workforce development. And this is key here too, is actually make sure we connect the infrastructure agencies who do the hiring or even um, uh, set up rules and regulations through their, uh, through their contractors to actually connect with the workforce intermediaries who are the real specialists in training people and getting them ready for the pipeline, right? So how can we do that better? Final challenge here is an ongoing disconnect between different levels of government. In general, there is still tension between what localities want to build and often what states want to build. And this is a perfect example in my adopted hometown of uh, Cleveland, Ohio. Um, this is a plan for the lakefront, which many folks obviously know it's on the lake. Um, and the city, uh, through multiple mayors, had big plans for what they wanted to do with what's known as Route 2 along the lake. But instead of what was built that the community wanted, this, the road, because it was a state road, ended up becoming a highway again. Now, nominally, there are some paths through, as you can see on this, to connect directly to the lake. But if this looks like the same attractive environment, if you think you're capitalizing in all ways that some of the most valuable land um, it is for that for the city, a city that really could use some fiscal help, um, then it's probably a longer conversation you have to have around what the future of actual projects should look like at a local level. And again, this is not about a bad project design. This is about a tension between what a state wanted versus what a locality wanted. Now, look, there is a lot of good things happening here, too. So I want to end on a high note with some of the innovations that are underway. And I'll tick through these really quick because the specific examples matter less than the categories, right? So one of the biggest innovations happening is climate-connected capital budgeting. And that goes by different names. But basically, the idea here is how can we actually have resilience and environmental goals connected to the projects we pick? And that's already underway in states like Colorado and cities like San Diego and even Montreal north of the border. Second is we're seeing new approaches to fiscal regionalism, right? So from some small towns in, in, um, in suburban Minneapolis, Minnesota, um, to even what our peers in Paris, France are doing, there are ways to cool our costs, to actually um, or cool our projects to bring costs down in different ways to tap into fiscal instruments we have at a local level, if not at a regional level, to help fund our infrastructure. And especially on that latter one in the Parisian example, as we many folks know from the experience of the Hong Kong transit system, we really can do much more here with instruments already legal in the United States. Third, expanded community voice and wealth creation. There are many efforts emerging on how do we diversify the procurement pipeline? How do we think differently about how we actually liaise with community voices, not just have community stakeholder meetings, but actually have ideas bottom up uh, um, or bubble up from the bottom, right? And actually feed in to our project list, both not just at the local level, but the state level too. And finally, we can modernize our workforce systems. The state of Pennsylvania has been getting some really good, well-earned press about committing 3%, um, fiscally speaking, from each of its projects um, into workforce um, uh, systems directly related to those projects. Um, we also did a scan at Brookings on, um, on, um, on climate action plans, the specifically the green workforce components. Here you can see examples in Los Angeles and Chicago that committed not just workforce planning, but real money to making sure they can get people into green careers. So if I can kind of finish here, there are a ton of opportunities, innovations underway, but there are still some kind of root and core challenges we need to think differently about if we want to actually deliver the kinds of projects that set up America for long-term success in the transportation space. Sorry. Thank you very much. That was a terrific presentation. And I know you're going to need to leave us a few minutes early to catch a flight. So um, I think I'll direct the first question to you, and I encourage um, participants to add additional uh, questions to the Q&A. Allison Martinson wants to know, how do you recommend encouraging state and local agencies just to, to strategically plan for resource allocation and project management when funding and political challenges may upset those plans? 
Allison, I do not get paid enough to answer that question. Uh, that, that's really hard. Um, uh, I will say this, um, I, and I'd love to hear. You started out by saying this was a fantastic presentation. So yeah, the flattery, flattery will get you nowhere. That is that is still a hard question. Uh, the, uh, I'd love to hear Morza and, and Maria's thoughts here too. Um, look, I, I and I really do believe this. I think it's connected. We're seeing it in different areas, different policy sectors, right? Different areas of governance. Um, if you think of it in like agency terms, everyone needs to hear more from community. The idea of, and it doesn't matter if it was engineers or a governor's office, you know, this idea of we'll look at the map and we'll just put the, the wide lane road wherever we want, right? Like that epoch, whether we can we can do a backward looking evaluation of it and folks have, and we even have, but I'm speaking forward looking now. That epoch is done. It's over. You cannot get away with that anymore. A very small cohort of folks making those decisions and receiving no blowback just won't exist anymore. The problem we have though, is what are the systems to actually make your voices heard? How do you hear from a community? Planners, we all know this, they want to, and engineers too, right? They want to go into neighborhoods and communities and hear from people, but how do they do that in ways that actually represents community voice? You know, Are they hearing from the right people? Or are they not? At the state level, we're doing some process mapping right now Saying, saying state DOTs processes are Byzantine is being really nice and generous to the state DOTs. And it's not because they aren't intending to do the best. There's no malice here. But it is so hard if you're an external actor, including local governments, to know where you engage with the process to help inform what ends up on the tip list, let's say, right? So I really think we have an important social moment that's happened on both sides of the political aisle, too. But people want their voices heard. That's just where we are in a communication kind of uh, epoch again. I'm sorry to keep using that. But now on the transportation side, we need new actual process systems to get those voices in, to have the kind of two-way dialogue, to think better about what does climate resilience really mean to my community? What does household affordability mean and transportation modal choice? Like those are, it's almost like we've won the day. So now we, now we need to deliver and that's gonna, that's gonna have some growing pains. And, and for everyone who's listening, if you're in a state or local level, experiment, right? We need to have more risk-taking behaviors on the process side. Otherwise we're not gonna learn and we're just gonna keep doing the same that we did in the past. You know, the only thing I would add to that is that um, you have to understand that it's an investment in the project, but, but your ability to have success at the end of the day is highly, dependent on that investment up front. And it's not at a low level. You've got to have senior people meeting with the community so that they feel like it's, um, it's you know, you're hearing and it's important. Uh, you know, just sending a staff person, um, you know, I laughed on a couple of the big projects that I've worked on. There were days I did two breakfasts, two lunches and two dinners, right? Because I felt like I had to be out there in an informal way talking to people to really get what they weren't going to put in a piece of paper. Um, the flip side is when you have NIMBYs or um, a former uh, senator, um, uh, late Senator Pat McGee from New York, um, she had an acronym that I love, cave people, citizens against virtually everything, right? You don't want them to have the outsized voice either. And, but you can't ignore it. You have to meet with them regularly to understand what the root issue is other than just, no, I don't want to do it. Because there's usually a kernel there of something you can do, but it requires a lot of abuse on a senior level. <laughs> and and uh, if I can also maybe add uh, something really quick to it, I think the other important thing is... Uh, to use the, the, uh, the, uh, the cases studies that, that we covered some of them today. I think when people uh, see actual projects, that why that project was successful, what happened, what are the key ingredients of that success, uh, they understand better that, 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 that how they can build their way to success for their projects and quite opposite of that, how projects have gone south because initially they thought that getting communities engaged may maybe add a couple of more months into the process up front, but down the road, it costs them tens of or, or hundreds of millions of dollars and, and years of delay. So putting those in front of them, those actual projects, what happened, I think is critical. And I-66, that I mentioned earlier, can be a really great example that, that the project that was mentioned, it was highly 
uh, controversial, different counties with different viewpoints, uh, transit people, highway people battling with each other, bringing them early in the process. I want to emphasize that word of stakeholder engagement, not a stakeholder outreach. You don't go and tell them that this is what we are doing. Engagement means come on board, help us build this, let's find the common ground, and then we all own this together. And that's exactly what happened in I-66. Once we, uh, at the time I was in Virginia, the other I was procurement manager for the project myself. Once we selected the, the best proposal, all three counties uh, passed a resolution and supported that project same week. That didn't happen overnight. That was four years of work with. Yeah. The only other thing that I would add is that um, the, the new cycle is, um, focuses on fantastic failures. So it's incredibly important for us to put the stories of great successes out there. I mean, that's one of the things that we're doing with several sister organizations as we talk about them as, as the roadshow about how things are being done well, quickly, and with different processes and procedures than maybe we've used in the past. Talking, we can't have the, the news cycle just all be negative, and it will be if we don't talk about our successes on a regular basis. I also think that in early engagement and stakeholder engagement, early investment and stakeholder engagement is part of what helps you bridge political transitions. Um, if, it's, if it's a project the community wants, a new governor or a new mayor is much more likely not to upend it. So, um, or at least you have allies outside who can, can support the project. Um, question for uh, Maria around your workforce comments. Um, what are your recommend, recommendations for recruiting and are you utilizing nonprofit youth agencies? Um, so we are looking at, uh, we have developed a pro program called Future World Vision, which is basically our board came to our industry leaders council and said, you know, we need a, a new vision. We had a vision 2025 about what infrastructure is gonna look like, right? We did that in the early 2000s. Um, ILC said no, because 25 years isn't far enough into the future, because we're building things for 50 to 100 years. And so we basically did um, basically a virtual reality, and we focused in on a mega city um, because of the challenges during COVID, to use it as a, not only as a recruitment tool, um, and we're actually next week, um, a companion to that is an IMAX movie that will be in, in science museums around the country. Um, after Engineers Week, we're, we're going to, you know, the public release is next February, um, where we used actual um, successes from around the world that we think will scale up. It's not science fiction, it's science fact. We had thousands of engineers look at what some of the best practices are around the world and how that might scale up into a mega city. And so um, those two components to get people excited, because we as a profession tend to put people out there with a hard hat and a vest and boots. And the mechanicals, for example, are doing robotics. Um, you know, you look at, at what, it, you know, what um, computer engineers are looking at. And so it's not as sexy as the other ones. And I, I think it's much sexier what we do. We do way more interesting things in much broader schedule. So it's about getting um, youth to understand that how innovative it is and that this is a profession for life. AI is not going to take this away anytime soon because we're creative problem solvers. It's not a wash, re rinse, and repeat cycle, but it's also about how we educate. So there are 58 schools that are using Future World Vision, either in undergraduate or graduate curriculum, to challenge their students to think about all the things like, how do you have drones come to a big building in 15 minutes and deliver lunch for a whole big building? Right. You got to think about that because that's going to happen in the next maybe five years, but certainly in the next 10. And so challenging you think more about how we deliver something that's going to be at function in the future by thinking differently about how we design today. And that's exciting. I mean, that's cutting edge, bleeding edge, exciting stuff. So um, we're working to kind of put the suite of things together so that we can get the interest up. Because the problem is, is that enrollments have been flat. We have been seeing flat in the industry across the hall. And if you look at, at high school demographics, they are going down between 10 to 20% in the next decade, because we just don't have that many high school kids. So this problem is gonna be go from, you know, 
uh, acute to crisis really quickly. And so we have to get people engaged and the, and they don't have to think that they have to be like math and science wizards to be part of this industry. I mean, that's part of it. Oh, it's hard. We, you know, whatever. So I think it's really important that we get that messaging out there because you can't build a healthy economy on a crumbling infrastructure. That sounds like really exciting set of initiatives and please keep us in the loop if we can be helpful in, in uh, dispersing the message. We'd be delighted We'd to do that. And I will watch for the IMAX movie. Um, this probably should be our last question. Maybe we have time for two. Question from Orteza was actually the first question. What's a reasonable estimate for the lead time to develop a TIPI loan application, including utilizing technical assistance? Two years, longer? Um, I know it, it depends. depends. It depends on the complexity of the project and what is the source of revenue that project sponsor is using to pay back the sample. It's really easy to underwrite those loans, especially if they want to take one of the previous loans that we have closed as a template loan agreement and not modify it too much. For those, we have closed loans and within about six months from the time that we have got all the information, but it does take some time to put the information package together to make sure that everything that we need to have in, in hand, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 a financial model, uh, an indicative rating from rating agencies is all in place. Uh, that's on the lower end. Uh, at least six months from the time that we have a complete package. I would say maybe another three to six months to put the package together. Those who are a little bit more uh, educated about and experienced about the process, they might be able to, uh, to close their second or third or fourth loan much faster than the first loan. Uh, but if there is a project that is planning to use project revenues, such as toll roads, for example, or in the case of transit-oriented development projects, if if a uh, if, if, if project is going to be um, uh, an apartment complex, for example, that, that rent is going to be used to pay for, for the construction. Uh, in those cases, we need to do market analysis, revenue analysis, and that adds a little bit more time to the, to the process. Uh, for key projects, those are the ones that tend to take the longest, usually two years or so. Not because we need two years to underwrite, we uh, pre-negotiate a term sheet with project sponsor and um, they use that term sheet in their RFP document. So all the bidders are bidding based on the same terms and conditions. Once they select their bidder, and that process usually takes about a year, that's the first year. Once they select their preferred bidder, we start negotiating with that preferred bid bidder who's going to then finalize the loan agreement with us and close it. And that may take another six to 12 months. So for P3 deals tends to be on the longer side, about two years. Thank you. Thank you both. We have a whole slew of more of really interesting questions, which we will try to address in, in other ways. But thank you for making the time. And thank you to Mr. Tomer, who's now taking a plane to get to a parent-teacher conference. So I respect his efforts at work-life balance. Um, I hope everyone can join us for our next event, which will be Thursday, October 26th two weeks from now, Eastern time, at 1 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, it will be the second part of today's discussion on accelerating project delivery through innovative procurement partnerships and financing methods. And we'll feature Brad Weifrick, Director of the Michigan Department of Transportation, Susan Shaw, Mega Project Director of VDOT, and Mike Johnson, Senior Vice President, Infrastructure Market and, Strat Infrastructure Market and Strategy at Kiwit. I'm also pleased to announce our finale event, which will be held on November 15th, again at 1 p.m. Eastern time. To commem we'll commemorate the second anniversary of the passage of Bill. Um, the speakers will be Maryland Governor Wes Moore, Dr. Chris Puchowski, I'm sure I've massacred that name, Director of Policy and Strategic Initiatives at Philadelphia's Office of Transportation, Infrastructure and Sustainability, and Tom Nisalki, Airport Assistant General Manager of Planning and Development at Atlanta Hartsfield Airport. They will each talk about a bill-funded project that they have currently underway in the project delivery and project benefits. 
So thank you all for joining us today. Please take a minute to provide us with some quick feedback when you receive a pop-up question at the end of the event. And again, thank you all for making the time. This is a really important topic. Uh, we need to just stay on it and keep it moving. Enjoy the rest of your day.